generation. Dates in the Bible don't quite match the marriage certificate. And welcome to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. This segment of the show is brought to you by 23andMe.com TNA. Boy, we got a lot of ground to cover here today. First of all, our guests coming up in just a little bit. I'm going to talk to Lisa Murphy. She is an ordinary person with an extraordinary find, and it's just unbelievable what uh, she has been able to do with her family with DNA and discovering the roots of her grandfather who came over from Italy and never spoke a word about where he was from. And everybody thought that when he passed, all of his secrets went with him. (laughs) But DNA, of course, changes that. We're going to hear Lisa's story coming up. And then a little after that, we're going to talk to Melissa Barker. You may remember her as the archive lady from Houston County, Tennessee. She's got some new finds to share with us this week. And I'm looking forward to hearing about that because, as you know, we love to encourage people to go out and not just search online, but go to places that have records and have the history right there that you can touch, you can feel, you can search, you can hold. Melissa's got the stories coming up a little bit later on. Hey, welcome, by the way, to our brand new Patrons Club members, Bill Harvey, Matthias Uthoff. He's from Germany. He signed up to be part of it. Robin Falk, Sebastian Gonsauer. He's another one from Germany. Christine Bartley, Marianne Suzaki, Ryan McMichael, and Becky Humphrey, all new members in our Extreme Genes Patrons Club. And you can sign up right now at patreon.com slash extreme genes or just click on the Patrons Club link at extremegenes.com. And congratulations, by the way, to our monthly winner for our weekly genie newsletter, Gary Swan. He is going to get a free one-hour consultation from David Allen Lambert, the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org, who coincidentally just happened to be on the line with me right now from Boston. How are you, David? Hey, things are looking great in Beantown. The leaves are piling up and it's getting a little chill in the air. That's what it's supposed to be doing at this time of the year. And I would imagine some of the chill has to do with the Red Sox being eliminated from the playoffs. But but I shouldn't digress like that. But anyway, how are you? Uh, that's good. Just put it on the downslide for the beginning of my news for you. But that's okay. <laughs> some exciting news. Reclaim the record says done it once again, Fish. They now have the marriage index for New Jersey from 1901 to 2016 available. Yeah, this is the index, by the way, not the certificates. Mm -hmm. And by the way, next week, we're going to have Brooke Gans on to talk about this great score and some other things they've got their eyes on right now. They're making life very difficult for a lot of the record holders around the country who just don't want to do their part to make these records easily available to the public. My next story actually takes place right here in Massachusetts, where back in April of 1990, two babies were born, Jessica Gomes and Aaron Barros. Now, they were born at the Morton Hospital and probably would have never met again until somebody in high school reintroduced them. They found out they had the same birthday. And in fact, they were the only two babies born that day in the hospital. Guess what? They're married now. (laughs) Isn't that great? There's a great genealogy story right there. Their kids, their grandkids, their great-grandkids are going to talk about it. And there is a picture, by the way, of her in the hospital. And just behind her in the background is another baby right there. It's a little out of focus. They can't tell. But it may very well be, probably is her husband, because he was the only other baby born that day in that hospital. (laughs) Forensic genealogist get to work. (laughs) (laughs) Where's Maureen Taylor when we need her? Maureen, help. Okay, my next story has to do with World War II. And, of course, we have many World War II veterans that are still with us, but not a lot of flying airplanes. In fact, this is a story about a B-17 Flying Fortress bomber, which is part of the Salute to Veterans Tour. And this is going on in Indiana where they're offering rides and ground tours of this B-17 Madras Maiden. And if you have a spare $450, you can go for a ride. Wouldn't that be fun? To fly in a B-17 just like your grandpa or great-grandpa? Or your dad, depending on right? how old you are. Exactly. Well, you know, that brings me to my next story, which actually starts off with my dad. The other day, I was showing my 14-year-old daughter, Hannah, a coin 
from 1925. That's when my dad was born. Well, she didn't know my dad. So to hold in her hand a coin, as old as her papa, as she calls him, was kind of fascinating. Then she turned to me and says, but do you have any for May? May is the middle name of my grandmother and her great-grandmother, which she got her middle name from. And lo and behold, I said, no, I don't. So I bought an Indian head penny from 1896. It dawned on me, why not create a family tree of coins representing the date of birth for each one of my ancestors, say back to my great great grandparents. I um, love that. I started it. Yeah. It's fun. It hasn't cost me a lot of money. I did a blog on the pastfinder.wordpress.com, which is my most recent post, and it's called Can You Spare a Penny for Your Ancestors? Collecting the Coins of Your Family Tree. It's been pretty popular, and you know what? It's so easy to do. You just go on eBay, plug in a year in a country, and what's nice about it, you're teaching your kids, your grandkids, not just their ancestor with an item that's from the time of their living, but you're also giving them world history and geographical history, and it's great stuff. It's a great idea, David, and I'm going to do it. I love that idea. <laughs> My blogger spotlight this week goes out to Paul Chittick, who has a blog on chittick'sfamilytree.wordpress.com. His topic is, what does the future hold? And this, of course, has to do with genealogy. So it's an interesting insight into this genealogist's idea of what the future in genealogy holds, which may be akin to how you feel about it. So take a peek at Paul's blog post, and if you do have an interesting blog, let us know. Maybe you'll be featured next week on Extreme Genes Blogger Spotlight. As you know, NEHGS has the opportunity for you to become a member, and if you want to save $20 on that opportunity, you can use the checkout code EXTREME and go to AmericanAncestors.org. That's what I have from Beantown. Check your pocket change, Fish. You may have some ancestors related in there. <laughs> you might be right, David. Thank you so much. And by the way, we got to welcome WIBW 580 AM in Topeka, Kansas. They're our latest radio affiliate, number 56, and we're thrilled to be part of their weekend lineup. Take care, David. We'll talk to you next week. Take care, my friend. All right. And coming up next, we're going to talk to an ordinary person with an extraordinary find. You're going to love this story coming up with Lisa Murphy. She's out of Utah. Coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Did you know that Family Search Family Tree is available through a powerful new mobile app experience? That's right. Now you can view, edit, and even add information to ancestors in your family tree whenever and wherever you are. You no longer need to wait to get home or make a date with your computer to view or update your family tree. You can add details to your tree when visiting with family or when capturing details from a trip to the cemetery. You can share new family history discoveries from classroom settings. Settings. You can even make the most of your time when waiting for doctor appointments or car repairs. Get started today by downloading the free Family Search Family Tree app to your Apple or Android device. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to get the Family Tree app for free. Exploring and expanding your family tree has never been more convenient. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to download the Family Search Family Tree mobile app today. Hi, Genies. It's Scott Fisher, host of Extreme Genes, with an invitation for you to join our brand spanking new Extreme Genes Patrons Club. Now, the Extreme Genes Patrons Club is where, for as little as a dollar a month, Genies everywhere can take advantage of Extreme Genes rewards, such as early access to our latest podcasts, members-only bonus podcasts, acknowledgement on ExtremeGenes.com, and special monthly live online question and answer sessions with well-known family history experts. Catch visits with Genie Technology stars such as David Allen Lambert, photo detective Maureen Taylor, DNA expert CeCe Moore, and many other experts and storytellers. If you find yourself craving more stories, more ideas for digging up your dead, more inspiration, the Extreme Genes Patrons Club is for you. The rewards start at just a dollar a month. Find out more now. Just go to ExtremeGenes.com and click on our special Extreme Genes Patrons Club link at the top right. Or go to Patreon.com slash ExtremeGenes.
Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com, provide your saliva sample from home, and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. And we are back. It's America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And this segment is brought to you by MyHeritage.com. And I'm excited to be talking to Lisa Murphy. And this kind of fits into the theme that we sometimes do on the show called Ordinary People with Extraordinary Finds. And Lisa, your find absolutely qualifies as you track down the ancestry of your grandfather who kept his mouth shut his whole life. Did you know him? I knew him as a young child. I think I was about 10 when he died. So I do have some memories, but not a lot. What do you know about him? What did he tell you about himself? Well, really nothing. He told us his name was Harry Mayo. He told us that he was an orphan and that he had come into this country through the port of Montreal, actually. He said that he was on his own from the time he was 13 years old and He remembers as a young orphan in the streets of Montreal stealing milk and bread off of people's front porches before they woke up in the morning to get their daily delivery so that he could eat. Grandmother was also an orphan, so my dad grew up with no aunts, uncles, cousins, or grandparents. Wow. Uh, Did he say where Mm -hmm. he was from originally? He said that he was born in La Havre, France, but we always thought that was strange because He was very Italian and spoke fluent Italian and spoke with an Italian accent. (laughs) Well, that might be your first clue, right? (laughs) That might be the first clue. That's right. And also it was strange because his last name was Mayo, M-A-Y-O, and there is no Y in the Italian language. And so who had an interest in actually trying to crack his case? Do you mean after people grew up? Because the kids asked him questions about himself when they were little. When they grew up to a point, they would ask their dad questions about himself, and he would get angry. Well, he would start by saying, oh, I don't know, that was a long time ago. And then if they pressed him, he would literally get angry, and he would say, I said, I don't want to talk about that. Wow. So he would he would literally get angry if you asked him any questions about his past. Huh. That is uh, mm-hmm. amazingly strange. So now he's long past. When did he pass away? Uh, 1969. Okay. And so his kids are still around. How many children did he have? He had four. Four. uh, Three boys and a girl. Okay. And now we have this new era here with DNA, and one of you decides, hey, it's time. Let's get a test and see what happens. Was the anticipation of doing this test to find out ethnicity, or was it to find matches, or both? You know, I don't think that we ever really thought about the matches. I think that we had more ethnicity in mind. Of course, my dad and uncle and my uncle Alvin were one of the first to get it done. And, you know, it was really kind of in the new stages of DNA before things really began to explode and we figured out what it was all about, you know, but because their dad was a mystery, they, they wanted to know what they were made of, Sure, you know, yeah, and well, I think so. most people go on now. Ethnicity is kind of what the big companies market. And uh, sure. and then some people find, oh, there are matches here, too. I mean, that happened to a friend of mine who was adopted, and we were actually able to identify her birth mother and birth father as a result. But she had had no anticipation of that when she took the test. She just wanted the ethnicity. Yes. So you found yes. matches. And when did the matches start coming in, and what did you find out? Well, it was interesting. When Dad and Alvin first got the DNA tests, which was 
over well over five years ago. They came back as like one of the only 3% of people that could not be placed. And we were thinking, oh, brother, I mean, this is truly a dead end everywhere we go. And then they said, we could tell you that you probably came from somewhere in the Middle East, probably Israel. So then that gave us another idea about my grandfather, like, okay, was he Jewish? Right, of course. I mean, we had exhausted everything. We had looked through prison records. Is he hiding a crime? You know, and then (laughs) then when the DNA came through, we thought, well, is he Jewish? Was he hiding that he was Jewish? Because lots of times people from the old country and and particularly Jews would hide that ethnicity. Sure, A lot of uh, people hid their ethnicity. Hungarians did. Yes. Irish. Yes. So then that was one thing. And then five years went by and then somebody contacted my uncle Alvin and her name was not. M-E-O. It was another name that, you know, a married name, you okay. know. Yeah. And so she contacted him and she said, I think we have a match. But they couldn't figure out where they matched because, of course, we had no family tree. Of course. Right. You know, because usually people, you know, when they have a match, they put their trees together and they say, oh, I see. Okay, here's our common ancestor. Mm-hmm. We, you know, we can't get past dad. So we have no family tree. So they talked for about a year, and they couldn't figure it out. And then another family member, totally unbeknownst to the original family member who contacted my uncle, she contacted him and said, we have a match. And she sent him a handmade family group sheet. Okay. Now, my grandfather did tell us that his parents were named Pietro and Katerina. So we knew that. And he he also told my grandmother that he had a brother named Marion who had died of an infection as a child. So we knew that. We had also found a previous wife of his by various means back in the 80s that we, ha- we didn't even know he'd been married before. And she told us in a letter that he had told her about a sister named Grace who was living in New York, but he had never mentioned a grace to us. But by, you know, various means, we had collected these four names that he said all these people were dead. Unbelievable. So this woman sends him this, like, typewritten family group sheet, and I don't know, it looks very, very old. Sure. And on it, it had the parents, Pietro and Katerina, And then it had 11 children on there. (laughs) And of the 11, there was one named Grazia, or Grace. Yes. And there was one named Mariano, or Marion. And it said that Marion had died of an infection as a child. Then there were all the children's names and who they married and what children they had. So there was a lot of names on this sheet. But at the very, very end, in the right-hand corner... It named a child Nunziato, and it said he immigrated to America and went to Boston and Toronto and disappeared. And we knew that we had our match. Wow. What a day that had to be for the family. It was 65 years in the making. I mean, my dad is 85 years old. Imagine being 85 and finding out your father's true identity, his true name, seeing his birth certificate. It was just, it was like the whole family has been on fire. Oh, on I can fire. only imagine. Now, you've met a lot of matches now. So were you able to link in with the original contact? Do you now know where yes. you're related to them and how this all oh, comes yes. together? Oh, it, well, the story just gets more magnificent every day. And there's not a day that goes by that something just, mind-blowing happens you know some new (laughs) revelation happens it's just it's mind-blowing like every day is an adventure and so what I did was I created a family Facebook page and I called it the Nunziato Mayo family so I just added all of our family members the MAYOs on there because 
everybody started getting online because once we had a name and sure. a place, yes, the information was very easy to find. I mean, my brother's getting online and he's finding so and so's death certificate and the picture of their gravesite and and their immigration record. And I'm getting online and my sister's getting online. And you know, there's all these various threads, you know, like running through the family by text and email. And there's different people on different threads, and so it's hard to keep up. And so what I did was I created the Facebook page so that we could have a common dumping ground so that when somebody found something, they could put it on the page and everybody could be there and everybody could see it. And then I thought, you know, I wonder if any of those MEO Mayos are on Facebook. And so I just started searching on Facebook for them. And both my sister and I started messaging people. And at first they were a little bit tentative because like they have this big Italian family and they're like, well, who are you? Yeah. You know, like where do what? you fit in? Well, that's off yeah, in the way, like, isn't it? Wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. And also, you know, they're um, Italian Sicilians. And I think that some of the older generation was like, wait a minute, let's check these people yeah. out first. <laughs> Just you a know? little bit suspicious <laughs> there, right? That's, yeah. There were a couple of them that were like, one said, well, you know, um, my dad needs to check you out. You know, <laughs> of course, he was, you know, he was our cousin Vinny, literally. <laughs> <laughs> cousin Vinny, let me tell you. Yeah, okay. That's so right. There were 11 kids in this family. Your grandfather was one of them. How many of the different branches now? The other 10. Well, I guess it would be nine because the one died young. Uh, how many yes. of those other branches are you in touch with now? We're in touch with five. Wow. Five of the other mm-hmm. nine. One, well, four in America and one that is still in Italy. That's incredible. Are you going to go over to Italy? Are you going to see the home country? Are you going to see the home city? Oh, my gosh. We have to. Of course, we've Google Earthed it already. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Taking a little tour. Yeah. Okay. Have you planned a reunion with any of these people yet? I want to. I'm in the process of planning one for next summer. And... Oh, I've got big plans. Oh, I've got such big plans. (laughs) Well, listen to you. That's so exciting. She's Lisa Murphy. She's from Orem, Utah, and her family has had a huge breakthrough thanks to DNA. And uh, just not only huge in terms of exciting, huge in terms of numbers. That's fantastic. So congratulations. She's an ordinary person with an extraordinary find. You can do the same thing. Lisa, thank you so much for your time. Oh, it was such a pleasure. I never get tired of talking about this. (laughs) I bet you don't. And who does? And coming up next in five minutes, we're going to talk to Melissa Barker. She is the archive lady in Houston, Tennessee. What has she found? You'll find out coming up on Extreme Genes. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. Zap the GrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Masters option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. 
Contact Family Chartmasters today at FamilyChartmasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chartmasters will give the greatest care to your family history. And we're back. It's America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And this segment is brought to you by LegacyTree.com. It was a while back we introduced America to my next guest. She is known as the Archive Lady. She is a professional researcher, still specializes in Tennessee research for many clients, but one day got roped into putting together an archive for her county. It's Houston County, as I recall, in Tennessee. Is that right, Melissa? It sure is. Houston County, Tennessee. Yep. She's Melissa Barker. Nice to have you back. I love having the Southern Bells back on the show. Thanks, Scott. It's great to be back, especially um, in October, which is American Archives Month. That is correct. And, you know, I remember you were telling me on our last visit that you weren't too excited about what was going to be required in putting together this archive for your county. And you have since fallen in love with it, embraced it. And I think the exciting thing about it is you're around material that isn't necessarily available online, which is the case for most all archives. That's true, Scott. You know, many, many of our archives across the United States and across the world have records sitting on shelves that are just waiting for researchers to discover. And and I'm a big advocate for old-time research. I'm I'm not really one who considers all the time you spend going through all the various sites as being genuine research. I mean, obviously it is because you're finding documents that other people have digitized, and that's great. But we become addicted to them and thinking, well, if it isn't there... It's just not to be had, but that is not the case. There's probably a lot more material available that's not online than there is online. Melissa, talk about some of the things you found recently, because you never call me unless you found something new and unique and exciting to help give an example to people of what they could find in an archive. Oh, well, since we last talked, we have found some very interesting items in our archives. One of the things that we have gotten recently is some stuff called loony money. Have you ever heard of loony money? Loony money. No, I don't think I have. <laughs> well, loony money is either in script, like paper money, or it's in coins. Okay. And it is from the local store. The store owner would have paid to their employees this money. But the catch was is that you could only spend the money in the store. <laughs> in the company store. So this was a nice way around paying. The, and, of course, they were making profit on it as well. So mark the prices up in the company store, right? Correct. And so we have two examples of some loony money in our archives. One was for the H.H. H. Buco Mercantile, and the other one is for the Daniel Mercantile out of Ellis Mills, Tennessee. And so... It's wonderful to find these items because it's something that researchers have never heard of, but yet maybe their ancestors used. Now, it's interesting you mention that because in researching my great-grandfather's coffee, tea, and spice mill in New York City, I often go through eBay and I ran across a coin from an Albany-based coffee and spice mill. And I wondered why their name was on this thing. It was from the 1860s, and I'm thinking that must be loony money like you're talking about. It sure could be. All right. What else have you found recently? Well, recently I had a local contractor donate a almost 100-year-old vacuum cleaner. He was cleaning out an old house and found this vacuum cleaner, and it is like one of the Bissels you can buy today. They have no motors. You just push them along the carpet, and it picks up stuff. <laughs> but it's all made of wood. A wooden vacuum cleaner. So it's not electric, because I'm thinking a 100-year-old vacuum cleaner. How could that be? I don't know when the first electric ones came along, but this is a wooden thing? Yes, it is completely wooden, and there's no motor. You just just, uh, push it along the carpet, and it picks up the dirt. And it is totally wooden, and it was made in 1920. And believe it or not, it still works. Now, what's that doing in an archive? I'm curious. Well, in our archive here in Houston County, we are the only facility in the county that collects and preserves our local history. And when I started the archives about six, seven years ago, we decided that we wanted to collect anything and everything having to do with Houston County, including artifacts and historical items, because we put them on display for people to come to the archives and see. Right. Uh, What a great idea to attract people to come by and, and check it out. What else have they donated to you, by the way? Oh, we used to have a railroad that came through here. Our county was big because of the railroad, and so we have lots of railroad memorabilia. 
and some other items that locals just come in and they have it in their hand and they'll say, well, do you want it? Or if not, I'm just going to throw it away. And of course, I grab it as fast as I can. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I'm always just horrified. I mean, from negatives and photographs, that's one thing. And you would think that would be more obvious. But some of these trinkets, that sounds great. I wish every archive would do something like that. All right. What else have you found within the archive that kind of raised your eyebrows, (laughs) Melissa? One of my favorite things that I have found here recently was we were working on the voting and election records of the county. And we ran across a City of Erin ballot, which is the main city here in Houston County. And the ballot was for 1952. Nothing really unusual about that until Mm -hmm. I looked on the back. And on the back was a handwritten fudge pie recipe. Ooh. That sounds. I just had brownies <laughs> last night, by the way. They were delicious, and I, that sounds similar. I love that cu- fudge pie, huh? And this was from yep. a, a ballot from 1952 for what kind of election? It was a city, a local city election okay. for the city mayor and the aldermen, things like that. I took the recipe, and I made the pie, and it was really good. Really? Did you serve it up to everybody around the archives? I did. I took it to the courthouse and served it up and told them this was a 1952 recipe. (laughs) That is absolutely amazing. So I'm confused, though. I mean, if you had a ballot, how would it wind up in the archive unless they were, you know, keeping some of these things to keep track for a recount potentially or something like that? And why would somebody write a recipe on the back of it? I have no idea. I can just envision someone, one of the little ladies maybe sitting there, you know, uh, signing people in to vote, and she's talking to the other lady and saying, I had this great fudge pie recipe, and the lady says, well, well, can I have it? And she writes it down. <laughs> and hands it over to her, and somehow it winds up back in your hands. That's incredible. Yep. It's one of the finds that I just love because it shows that people were people just like we are today. Yeah, absolutely true. Well, what a great concept, though, to to gather things from around the area, bring them into the archives, and then lure people in to do some research there and see what they can find like you have. What else have you uncovered lately for us? Um, Well, working on our picture collection right now, and one of the things I'd like to tell your listeners about is looking for those unidentified photographs in archives. Many of our archives have them, and if you know what your ancestors look like, you might find some more photographs of them in those unidentified photographs. Boy, it's funny you mention that. There's a state archive near me, and I actually discovered a photograph of my grandfather and his seventh child from 1921 after his first wife died, and he had to take it back to his mother to take care of while he was looking for a new wife and going back and taking care of his own kids who were out of his state. So, yes, there was that picture there, and that was a complete shock to me. I would imagine that's fairly common for archives all over the country if you know where to look. Exactly. You know, most of our archives have photograph collections, but they don't necessarily advertise that they have parts of their collections that are unidentified. And so when you're researching in archives, make sure and ask about those unidentified photographs. You might be able to identify some for them. I would assume that you would look under things like uh, police photographs, firemen photographs, if they belong to different groups. Absolutely. A lot of times they are archived that way, according to group or according to surname. And so always talk to your archivist uh, wherever you're researching and pick their brains about what they have in their collections. And I would say also it would be a great thing to do if you have unidentified photographs. Do not throw them away. Take them to your local archives, and maybe someday somebody's going to come across it and say, oh, I know who that is. Scan it and put it online for everybody's benefit. Absolutely, because you may have the only known photograph of someone's ancestor. And if you donate it to an archive and it can get identified, what a wonderful treasure. Well, she's the archive lady. She's Melissa Barker. She's from Houston County, Tennessee. Thanks so much for your time, Melissa, and we'll talk to you again soon. Sounds great, Scott. And coming up next in three minutes, Tom Perry talks preservation on Extreme Genes. Well, Genies, my personal family history researcher who sends me new information day and night has sent me some incredible new records and newspaper stories lately. Hi, it's Fisher, and the name of that researcher, by the way, is MyHeritage.com. It's the hardest working service in genealogy, looking for records of your family 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yes, even while you're sleeping. How does it work? MyHeritage uses hundreds of algorithms to match your ancestors to over 5 billion records from around the world. 
world and with 97% accuracy. That means no more wasting time figuring out whether or not a match really is a match. I hear from listeners all the time who are shocked with how much information is accurately found and then passed along. And now MyHeritage will translate your ancestors' names into English or any other language you like from foreign records. In fact, it works with over 40 languages. No one else does this. Whether you're a beginner or seasoned researcher, you need MyHeritage.com. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com. Provide your saliva sample from home and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. Legacy Tree Genealogists is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've been working with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins or heirs to property. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest highest client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll-free at 1-800-818-1476. Call now or register online to get a free estimate. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. LegacyTree.com. Welcome back. It's America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. I am Fisher, your radio root sleuth. This segment is brought to you by FamilySearch.org, talking preservation with Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. He is our preservation authority. Tom, it's been a while since we talked about audio. Oh, it has. We've had so many things with all the floods and the hurricanes and the earthquakes, how to prepare for them, how to take care of them. And we've totally neglected audio for weeks. Well, you know, audio is one of those things I think a lot of folks think it's just irretrievable when something isn't the way it used to be. For instance, cassettes, right? You must hear about that all the time. Oh, yeah. People come in and in our showroom, we have some tapes that like major melded damage, all kinds of things. And people go, oh, you can fix those? Oh, yeah. You know, and I show them a sample of one. Yeah, some little girl put this on the top of a lamp and it melded. And it was something very important to them. The people had passed on that had made the tape. And they go, is there any way you can recover that? I go, yeah, sure. Because the thing you have to understand is a flashpoint of the case, whether it's audio or video, and the tape itself are a lot different. So you can have a case totally melt on you, and the tape is usually still good. Sometimes we might have to go in and repair the tape, which is no big deal. But we surgically take the cassette apart, put it in a brand new shell, and nine out of ten times, it just plays fine. Isn't that amazing? But sometimes I know the tape gets caught up inside either the audio or the video cassette case. That's usually a problem for the ordinary person. Exactly. In fact, preventative maintenance on that is if you find an old tape and you find an old tape recorder, don't put that tape in that old tape recorder. Because even if it's sat for two or three years, there's gunk that's going to get caught on the pinch rollers, on the heads, all kinds of things. And what will happen, as soon as the tape touches it, it's going to start wrapping around it instead of going back through the other ah. place. Then you pop your cassette open, and you see this tape going every place. If you've already gone too far, don't try and take the tape out and bring it to us. Bring the whole cassette into us, and that way we can probably recover more because we know how to take it apart. So bring the whole thing to us if that happens. 
But if you have a whole bunch of tapes and you want to listen to them before, you can always have them clean. We can clean them. There's probably places in your local area that does repairs. Talk to them and say, hey, I've got an old cassette machine. Can you clean the heads? Most people can do it themselves. It's just not hard. And I'm sure there's YouTube videos that show you how to do it. Just make sure that when you do it, you use a good quality isopropyl alcohol. Use ones that are at least 90%. Don't use uh, dollar store types that are 50% because you're adding too much water in there. So go in and clean them with some good Q-tips, and then you can go ahead and run it. But make sure you don't just put it in a machine. You have no idea what the history is because it could ruin your tapes. If you can't do that, look at your tapes and read and see which one is the least important and try that one first. Boy, that's a great idea. Are cassettes the most common bits of old audio you receive at your store for digitization? Absolutely. We receive more of those than anything. But then second place is really kind of interesting. The second most one we get are what they call the wire recordings. It looks just like fish line, but it's made out of wire. And the neat thing about it is the wire doesn't degrade like a tape does. And so we have people that bring these in from the turn of the century, and you'd swear the person standing right next to you that's talking because they last forever. How old is the oldest one you've had in that you've been able to listen to? You know, I can't actually put a date on them. I mean, I've had stuff that has been like way, way, way old, and I would say, you know, pretty close to turn of the century type stuff. And the strange thing is we've had it on display, and people have come up to us at one of our scanning parties or at a family history conference we went to, and they go, Oh, we had some of those. We thought they were old fishing line of grandpa's, and we didn't even know he fished. Oh, no. And, and they'd thrown them out. They had thrown them out. And what's those the, what's the quality like on those? Oh, it's amazing. It's really? abso- oh, it's better, better than, than audio cassette. Yeah, I would say it had to be, right? Because it's metal. Exactly. And so the metal doesn't degrade like a tape would, so it lasts forever and ever and ever. These things will be around way after cassettes have just totally flaked away. Well, next time you come in, Tom, you're going to have to bring one of these wire recordings because I've never seen one. Yep, they're cool. They look just like the old fish line, except they're metal. And we'll find out some of the other items you typically see that might be a little more unusual to our listeners and me coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities. And it's free. Sign up for The Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Genes Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's top 10 tips for beginning genealogists from the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for the Weekly Genie. We 
are talking preservation with Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com, our preservation authority on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. It is Fisher here, and Tom, last segment we were talking about the most common audio that you get in for digitization at your store, and that would be cassette tapes. And then you mentioned the second most common thing were old wire recordings, which I've never seen, and how amazing they are and how far back they go. What else do you get? What's the next thing? Okay, number three isn't a big surprise, but it's vinyl records. And when I say vinyl, I'm throwing everything into that batch because it's not just vinyl. We have the old steel records, the aluminum ones. We have all kinds of things. In fact, I remember back when my oldest brother was getting ready to go to boot camp during the Vietnam era. There was a little, almost like a phone booth that you go in, you drop a quarter in, you talk to it, and a record pops out. Sweet. And then you drop it in the mail. They have a container for you. Exactly. We have people that were over in the service wherever around the world, and they would send them to their family. Their family would send them to them, and thank heavens they preserved them. And so we have a lot of people that bring those in. We even have people bring in the old cereal boxes back, and I think it was during the 60s. Yes, I remember those. They'd have like little Christmas songs on the back, whatever, and you'd cut them out, put them on your turntable. And all they were were, you know, kind of a varnish type stuff on the back of the cardboard. So they didn't last long. They cracked easy. And so they weren't their best in the world. And an interesting thing about that is I've always told people don't throw them away if they're broken or chipped because one day they'll come out with it because they have the technology of a record player that's a laser. Mm -hmm. And lo and behold, about a year ago, they actually came out with one. The only problem is it's for really high end people because like 15 grand for the machine. And there's no way we can justify it. So hopefully one day, just like anything that's new in a few years the price will come down because i would love to have one of these because every once in a while we get warped records in or records that are severely scratched or broken but i've always told people don't throw them away because one day the technology will be here it is here now we just need to wait for the price point to drop or get a winning lottery ticket so (laughs) so when you come across an old record an old piece of vinyl obviously a personal recording not a problem for you to copy but when it comes to a commercial recording that's a problem Problem. Back to a certain date, I would assume. What date do you go by? We don't actually go by date. There's a law that's called the Fair Use Act, and it will allow you to take one media and change it to a different form of media, which is called a convenience factor. So if you have an old album, an old Christmas album or something like that that you'd like to get transferred to CD, we can do that. But the law requires you, you cannot sell that CD, you can't give that CD away, you can't give the record away. Legally, you're supposed to keep the record and the CD together at all times. It's more like the law says. It's a convenience factor. I don't want to get out my turntable. I want to listen to a CD. So that's fine as long as you keep the things together. But if you try to copy it or do anything like that, then you're going to run into copyright violations. All right. That was number three. We're running out of time. What's number four? Number four is really strange. It's called wax cylinders. It's called the Edison oh, wax wow. cylinders. Oh, wow. We're talking way back now. Oh, yeah. Oh, way, 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 Were way back. Were they voice recordings or the commercial ones, or do you get them both? Yes, <laughs> we get them all. <laughs> They're really interesting. The biggest reason we don't get more of those is because since they are wax, if you don't take good care of them, they'll melt, they'll get abrased, they won't work right. But even if those are cracked, we can usually fill them with a polymer and still transfer them. So that's always an option. And then the weirdest one, I would say, is you cannot believe the number of 8-track tapes we get in. Really? Yeah, and we do 8-track tapes actually both directions. We have people that have like a 69 collector Mustang that want to have new music on their 8-track. So we make them an 8-track out of current music, and it blows the minds of the people at the car shows. (laughs) That's great stuff. Thanks so much, Tom. We'll talk to you next week. My pleasure. Hey, that's a wrap for our show this week. Thanks so much for joining us. Remember, Extreme Jeans Patrons Club members catch the podcast first and get bonus podcasts twice a month, as well as an Ask Me Anything live YouTube session. Sign up for our Patrons Club at ExtremeJeans.com. Just find the link there or go to Patreon.com slash Extreme Jeans. Also, sign up for our weekly Genie newsletter. You can find that at ExtremeJeans.com. It's absolutely free. We got thousands of followers there for my article each week and all kinds of great links to great stories talk to you next week thanks for joining us and remember as far as everyone knows we're a nice normal family